thank you very much for coming today afternoon, today evening. And uh, I'll speak today on the topic of who is a leader. Now, leadership has become one of the most needed attributes in the world today. In fact, whichever area we work in, can you keep one more comment here? Oh, it's all one comment switch. It's all one comment switch, please. Okay. I think you can see without the light also, with the light also, okay. You're operating it, Mohan? Yeah, I'm just trying to find it. Okay, okay. Right. So, I talk on this theme of leadership. First, I'll talk about the con concept of leadership in about first 15, 20 minutes, 15 minutes. And then I'll talk about how principles of leadership are demonstrated in the Bhagavad Gita, which is a time-honored text of spiritual wisdom. And after every 10, 15 minutes, I, I'll pause, and if any of you have any questions or comments, please feel free to share them. So leadership is required because just for a part of today's academic profile, where people want to go to work in a company, everybody is looking for leadership. Now, what exactly is required for a person to be a leader? And let's look at this. First of all, leadership is not a matter of designation, but it's a matter of disposition. So somebody doesn't have to appoint somebody to be a leader. If we see some of the greatest leaders in world history, uh, whether we look at Mahatma Gandhi in India, Martin Luther King here in America, or anyone else, most of them were not born in illustrious families. Nor of them, nor many of them, were really born with outstanding qualities right from their birth. But it is a disposition of taking responsibility for something bigger than oneself that brought out leadership. So now, generally, we may have some conception of leadership means that leaders have to be charismatic, leaders have to be very eloquent speakers, leaders have to command a huge following. Now, these are attributes of what we could call as public leadership. And separate from public leadership is personal leadership. Personal leadership is where a person, oneself, is collected, is together. That means their vision, their mind, their senses, their actions are all, are all coordinated. In fact, if without being a personal leader, Somebody becomes a public leader. All that happens by that is they raise the height from which they fall. Without inner leadership, outer leadership, even if it achieved, it only even if it is achieved, it leads to disaster. And if you look at the again at the world around, the biggest problems in the world have been caused not by illiterate people or uneducated people or people who had no qualities. It is people who had tremendous abilities, but they were themselves misled. If you consider the example of Hitler, he was quite a commanding speaker. He had leadership qualities, but he caused one of the biggest disasters in recent human history. So, he was ultimately misled by his own beliefs, his own ideas of things. So basically, without the foundation of uh, integrity, of virtue, of personal stability, when one becomes an external leader, then that leads, to, that leads to one hurting oneself as well as hurting others. So quite often, when we talk about leadership, we may operate based on certain stereotypes of what a leader should be and what, whether we have those qualities or not. And I was just a few months ago speaking in, uh, just a month ago I was speaking in Stanford. So after that I was talking with one of the professors over there. And he was quoting a book about uh, Ivy League students and uh, their predicament. This book called, is written by a Ivy League, former Ivy League professor called Excellent Sheep. And he describes there that 
primarily the students here go through two st emotional states. One is grandiosity and the other is depression. Grandiosity means that as long as they feel that they are better than others, they feel great about themselves. And as soon as they start seeing that others are better than them, then they start feeling low, they start feeling depressed. So if our sense of self-worth is coming from our externals, whether we are better than others or not, we live in a competitive world and we have to sometimes compete against others. But our sense of self-worth doesn't have to come from our superiority over others. It can come from our individuality. It can come from our spirituality. So personal leadership is what gives a person stability in life. And personal leadership is a matter of designation. Not a matter of designation, but disposition. So John Maxwell is a leadership consultant. And he says, sociologists tell us that even the most introverted individual will influence 10,000 other people during his or her lifetime. Just by being who we are, people observe us, people interact with us, and people are influenced in some small or big ways. So in that sense, leadership is not a matter of uh, achievement, which we will become a leader. It's leadership is just a matter of endowment. Just being born, everyone is a leader in some way or the other. The question is whether we are leading or misleading. Whether we are helping others, whether we are hurting others, whether we are bringing out our best potential or we are bringing out our lower side. Now, if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is a talk between two leaders. It is spoken by Krishna to Arjun. And the theme of this talk, I have a full book on this topic called Leadership Sutras from Bhagavad Gita. So I'm talking based on that. So Krishna, if we see, he was, in today's parlance, we could call a self-made person. Yeah. He is, he was a person who was born amidst great adversity. There was a whole plot to kill him. And he rose from, he was just a coward boy. But he rose from obscurity and against adversity. There were numerous attempts to assassinate him. And yet, despite those attempts, he persevered. And eventually, when he overthrew the tyrant Kamsa and became and could become the king, instead, he made the father of Kamsa, whom he, Kamsa had overthrown as the king. So Krishna demonstrates his own position, by his own example, that he put contribution above position. That he is not interested in just anointing himself with the title of a leader. He was interested in contributing. And similarly, if we consider Arjun, he was both born in a ruling dynasty and he was himself, by his virtuosity, by his expertise in archery, he was the, one of the foremost archers of his time. So he was a leader in his own right. Although he was not the king, he was the younger brother of the king, but still, he was the foremost archer and the most important warrior among uh, in the Kurukshetra war that was fought. So basically, when two leaders are going to meet and discuss, their discussion is the Bhagavad Gita. Now, if we look at the context of the Bhagavad Gita, it is very striking. To understand this, let's consider a parallel. Say, suppose there's a World Cricket Cup, Cricket World Cup finals between India and Pakistan, and maybe at the world's biggest stadium, Eden Gardens or wherever. Thousands and thousands of people are there in the stadium. And then millions of people are watching on their TVs. And then the toss is done, the fielders are set, and the batsmen go in, and the batsman, bat, and the striker takes guard. And at that time, as the baller is just in the run-up, about to start, at that time, the striker calls the non-striker. And the two of them start talking. And they keep talking. And they keep talking. And they just go on talking. Now, everybody would want to know what is so important. Why would you keep everybody else waiting, millions of people waiting? Why do you have to talk so important? Now, some people might just want to 
disrupt the momentum of the opponents and that's why they may slow down the game. But if we know that you players are not like that, they're sportsmanly, then if you really want to know, there must be something very important that they're talking at this point. So actually the Bhagavad Gita is spoken in such a setting. Mm -hmm. The whole Kurukshetra battlefield is there. Uh, everybody is ready for war. At that time, Krishna tells Arjun, Sena yoru bhayoru madhye gatham sthapaya me achyuta. That, please take my arms, chariot in between the two armies. And in between those two armies, he says, he asks Krishna some questions. And Krishna answers those questions. And those questions, what are they about? Essentially, Dharma Chetaha. Arjun asks Krishna, please tell me what is dharma. The word dharma actually comes from the Sanskrit dhri. Dhri means to sustain. So today some people translate the word dharma as religion. But there is only one, one understanding of dharma. Dharma refers to that which sustains existence. So that which is the inherent order in nature, that is dharma. So for example, if I drop this mobile, I won't drop it, but if I drop it, it will fall down. Now, when last, about two years ago, I had gone to Cambridge University to speak on science and spirituality, and along the way we passed by the same tree where Newton is said to have seen the fruit falling. Some people say it fell on him, some people say it fell in front of him. Now, whichever way, Newton saw the fruit falling and he asked, what made this fruit fall? So now that question if, is actually a search for dharma. What is the nature of things? What is the nature of reality? What is it in nature that makes objects fall down? So dharma is not a sectarian religious concept. It is a universal inquiry into the nature of reality. So specifically, the science is talking about understanding the order in nature. So what makes things work the way they do? So there is an order in nature. Science presumes that and then tries to discover that. So the Bhagavad Gita takes the same region and applies it to consciousness. That all of us are conscious beings and is there a harmonious way in which consciousness can function? So dharma is the way we can be who we are. We can harmonize <laughs> with our own nature and we can harmonize with the totality of reality. That which will sustain our existence is dharma. So for somebody who is an artist, then their art is their dharma. For somebody who is an archer, their archery is their dharma. For somebody who is a scientist, the science is their dharma. That is what characterizes their nature. That is what enables them to be who they are. Now when Arjun is asking, I am confused, please tell me what is dharma. So he has a specific situation. What am I meant to do in my life? What course of action am I meant to follow? So then, I'll, he has to take a decision about the war. Should I fight? Should I not fight? So Krishna tells Arjun about not just, he doesn't give simply an answer, fight or don't fight. If that's what the Bhagavad Gita was all about, the Bhagavad Gita would have just ended with one word, fight or don't fight. But the Bhagavad Gita doesn't give, us a, give Arjuna a ready-made decision. Rather, it gives Arjun the framework by which one can make decisions. The essence of Bhagavad Gita is not about fighting. No, the essence of the Bhagavad Gita is finding out what action we are meant to do. What is our place and purpose in the bigger <coughs> scheme of things? And in that sense, the Bhagavad Gita is a conversation among leaders which is going to have enormous consequences on many, many people who are their subjects and who are fighting in the war. So as I said, the Gita's approach to leadership is that the Gita leaders, they do many things. Leaders inspire others, leaders guide others, leaders uh, instruct others. But one of the defining characteristics of leadership is decision making. Now who to, if there's a team, 
if there's a cricket team and the captain decides who will open, who will come at this at what time, who will bowl when. It's all about decision making. And the Gita gives us a foundation for making decisions. And for all of us, I talked about I began by talking about personal leadership and public leadership. So in both these domains, if we learn to make decisions soundly, then not only can we bring out our best, but we can lead others and help them to bring out their best. So the Gita is essentially a conversation between leaders. <coughs> so any comments or questions till now? Feel free to comment or ask whenever you feel like it. So I'll move on to the next point now. So this is so we'll talk about the principles of leadership described in the Gita using an acronym LEAD. So L is learning, T expanding, A appreciating, and D is deciding or determining. Let's look at this, learning. Now, to be a leader, one needs to be a constant learner. And the Bhagavad Gita explains that the universe is like an university. And through every situation in life, we can learn. But we need to learn how to learn. The Gita itself demonstrates this principle when Krishna transforms a battlefield into a classroom. We talk about improvised learning situations, experiential learning. <coughs> Krishna demonstrates it in an ultimate way. In the middle of a battlefield, where there is enormous tension and anxiety there, by his presence and presentation, Krishna raises the consciousness of both the participants. And they discuss issues and they discuss levels of wisdom that have rarely been revealed before or after. So learning centers not just on observing external situations. It also centers on, link on linking with our inner leader. What do I mean by the inner leader? If you look at the history, the intellectual history of the world, whether it is great scientists or whether it's great artists, great authors, they all say that their biggest, their best works came, or their best insights came by inspiration. Now, inspiration means that there is A, B, C, D, there are logical steps going on. But suddenly we get an answer which we can't get by logical thinking. And during inspiration, it is almost as if the answer is revealed to us from within. From somewhere, it's just revealed to us, it comes to us. And when we get that answer, probably there are examples throughout history. Archimedes is probably the greatest example. He was just bathing and suddenly he got an answer. And Eureka, he was jubilant. So there are scientists who, who have got answers, KQ, got the answer of the benzene ring while he was sleeping. He saw a twisted snake with a tail going around its head. And from that, he got the structure of benzene. So uh, we see that some of our best insights, yes, we do have to work hard. We do have to analyze. We do have to prepare. But our best insights, they can come. There is a source of wisdom that is greater than us, and that is accessible to us. So leadership, the Bhagavad Gita explains, is not just about learning from externals. Yes, we have to observe the situation, <coughs> we have to learn from the situation. But the Gita also tells us that by spiritual growth, we can go inwards, and we can link with our inner leader. There is an aspect of the divine that is present within us. And that aspect of the divine is like the ultimate GPS. <coughs> now that GPS can guide us from within. Now this might seem a little abstract concept, but the principle here is that when we learn from external out observation and internal introspection, then 
we can always be on the progressive path in life. We think there are certain specific skills that we learn. We learn specific softwares, that's good. And that can help us to do some specific programs. But there are some skills which, are, which have an expiry date on them. Software that is very useful today, after one year, after five years, it may no longer be useful. <coughs> but learning from life and moving forward in terms of making sound decisions, this is something which we can do always. So if we are driving a car, at that time, we might have a GPS which will tell us a map. Okay, turn left, turn right. But we have to look at the GPS and we have to look at the territory. We look at the map, look at the territory, and see how the map correlates with the territory. And then take the right turns. So the Gita's wisdom is, which is revealed by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, is like a map. And that same speaker of the Gita, Krishna, is present within our hearts also. So when we have the map, then we can take sounder decisions. So leadership is first and foremost about having a mood of learning. Then the second point is expanding. <coughs> expanding means to see the biggest picture, the bigger picture. There's a Kenyan proverb which says that when two elephants fight among each other, it is the grass that is the herd that is hurt the most. <laughs> now what that means is that when two leaders fight among each other, there are there is a lot of collateral damage which happens <coughs> to all the people who are under them. Whether it be two politicians, whether there are two nations that they fight because of two political egos, or even within a family. If the parents fight with each other, most damage are the children by that. So leadership means that we have to learn to see the bigger picture. And when we see the bigger picture, then we don't get caught in small things. So this expanding the conception of, of life at large, that is the key to leadership. Managers are those who can do things better. They're, they're clinically one, two, three, four, five, they can do things better. But leaders can see the bigger picture and see what really needs to be done. Uh, so managers are those who can climb efficiently up the ladders. But leaders are those who check, is this ladder resting on the right wall? So today, most of our society, unfortunately, sets us up on a rat race, where we're just chasing one goal after another, after another, after another. And while we're chasing goal after goal after goal like this, what we don't realize is that even if we win the rat race, we still remain rats. Nothing really changes. So the Gita enables us to expand our conception of life. And there are three aspects to it what it expands for us, the self, our work, and our success, the definition of success. So let's look at this. Self means, the Gita explains that if we want to get a big picture in life, we have to have the big picture of ourselves. A big picture of ourselves means that we are not limited to our biology. Our destiny is not limited by our biology. Biology means our a body is fated to decay, to deteriorate, to be destroyed. But we are something beyond the body. There is a non-material spark of consciousness. That is the soul. And that is who we essentially are. Now this understanding can help us to see that life is not like a 100 meter sprint. For all of us, society sets up certain goals for us. And then we run to achieve those goals. And when we have a very reductionistic conception of ourselves, say, say in a materialistic conception of life, people equate their self-worth with their net worth. So if I'm earning a lot, then I'm a great person. <coughs> or in student life, we may equate our self-worth with our grades. Now, grades are important. Money is important. But that doesn't define who we are. We are much more than that. Some of the most successful people in life are those people who were college dropouts. 
they hardly got any grades. Some of the people who influenced society the most, they were not people who had a huge amount of money. So there is, we are bigger than our externals. Whether it be our grades, our wealth, our looks, we are spiritual beings. <coughs> and thus, <coughs> when we have this bigger vision, when problems come in our life, we don't get caught by those problems because we can see the bigger picture. If we consider what is the point of expanding our vision, so if uh, from a top of a mountain, say a river is going towards the ocean, now if the river is, river is restricted to one channel, now if that channel gets blocked, the river will get blocked. But the river is going through various tributaries. See, if this path gets blocked, let me take this path. If this path gets blocked, let me let me take this path. So we all need for functioning properly, we need psychological flexibility. Psychological rigidity is where this is the way I have to do things. But life, we can't control it. Sometimes we make a particular plan and that plan gets permanently blocked. We just can't move forward. So psychological rigidity locks our purpose in life to a particular path. And if that path is blocked, we feel my life is wasted. But psychological flexibility means that we understand my life has many aspects to it. My, my, I, I as a person am bigger than the roles that I am playing. And if a particular role is blocked, if a particular goal is unachievable, I can shift. I can do something else. <coughs> then the Bhagavad Gita's teachings on work are most interesting. The Gita talks about work in a mood of worship. Now some people translate that work is worship. Now, work is worship is a good ethical principle. All work should have dignity of, I mean, all work and all workers should be respected. No work should be looked down upon. In that sense, it is a good ethical principle. But if philosophically, if we say work is worship, then that would mean that donkeys are the greatest worshippers. <laughs> we work harder than anyone else. So work can be done in a mood of worship. The Gita's teaching is Swakarmana by your work, worship the Lord. What does that mean? That means we understand that every one of us has been given certain talents. And with our talents, we are meant to make certain contributions. So when we work in a mood of worship, our purpose is not just to make get some achievements. Yes, we want to achieve. But achievement is a fruit of commitment. If we just commit to being the best that we can be, in a mood of service, in a mood of worship, then the results will come in due course. So the Gita's uh, teaching in this regard can be stated as, what we are is God's gift to us. What we become is our gift to God. What we are is God's gift to us. We have certain talents, certain abilities, and they are our resources. And how we contribute to that, not just to do things externally, but to become better internally. That is our gift. So work can be seen in this much bigger picture. Now different people can see the same work differently. There are three teachers who are teaching in a classroom. Now, a one teacher can say, what are you doing? If somebody asks the teacher, what is it? I'm trying to discipline these stupid, demonic, these stupid, terrible kids. See? Now the other teacher may say that I am, I'm earning my living. The third teacher may say I am shaping the minds of those who are going to shape the world tomorrow. So the activity that they are doing may be the same, but the vision will make a lot of difference. When we have a bigger picture of what we are doing, then we don't get caught by small, small frustrations. So when we see work as an act of worship, then even if there are obstacles, even if there are reversals, we don't get caught by them. We don't get obstructed by them. And then, with respect to success, many of us know one verse from the Bhagavad Gita, Karmanne Vadhikarasti. Have you heard this verse? Yeah, Krishna says, don't you have a right to work? You do not have a you do not have a right to the results. So, 
I gave a talk in Princeton a couple of years ago. I spoke on the Mahabharata. So after that, one person was asking this question. When he says, "This point, this teaching of the Bhagavad Gita makes no sense at all." He says, "Don't be attached to the results. We work for results." In fact, many management uh, and leadership books or self-help books will tell, "Keep your goal clearly in your mind. Envision it, and that will inspire you to work." So, if we are to be detached from the results, then what would motivate us to work? So, it might seem absurd, absurd if we don't understand what the results say. So, the Gita was spoken to Arjun, and Arjun, after that. when he was fighting the kurukshetra war every day he was setting goals and the 14th day when arjun's son abhimanyu was very viciously and nefariously killed he set a goal to get even with those who had butchered his son and arjun krishna didn't tell arjun at that time hey you forgot in the gita don't be attached to the results So to understand this, what the Gita is teaching, we will understand the difference between goals and results. So goals are what we set before we do an action. Results are what we get after the action is done. Setting goals inspires us to offer our best. However, results are not in our hands. there are factors beyond us which shape the results and refusing to acknowledge that only sets us up for frustration i was just a month ago in canada in calgary and there uh, <coughs> because of the oil the sources oil prices going up and down there is a huge there is a big economic crisis and there are people who are well educated and uh, uh, qualified But suddenly they lost their jobs. It's not that they were not performing well; they just lost jobs. So sometimes factors beyond our control shape things, and if we get too attached to results, then we start blaming ourselves for failures that are not in our control. One major cause of depression is that people get people identify themselves with results. that are not in their control whether the result could be relation relationship a career goal a position whatever it is so setting goals is positive so a simple example to illustrate this is say a student has to give a series of five exams one after another after another and they set the goal you know i want to get grade a <coughs> and the first exam they give and they prepared well they do the exam well but somehow some questions come up which are very difficult and they're not sure how much marks they will get now in that exam so now that exam is over if they keep oh, how much will i get only if i had studied this i would have done that better or if only i had answered this like this i would have done that better then that obsession with the results will obstruct them in preparing for the next exam so uh, attachment to results consumes our mind and prevents it from being available for the future task so set so the gita is not against setting goals what is in our control we are meant to do the best of our capacity but if the gita expands our vision of reality to help us understand that the results are not determined by us alone so this is a whole big subject but i just mention this briefly what the gita tells us is that when we get results there are three factors involved there is karma daiva and kala karma is our action daiva is destiny and kala is time and then we get the phala that is the result so for example if a farmer plows the land and sows the seed that's karma the rains come on time in the right quantity that's daiva then the season changes to the harvesting season that's the kala and then the phala will come So when Krishna is saying karmanne vadika raste ma phale shu kadachit, so he's simply telling us understand reality that your karma alone doesn't lead to the phala, your action alone doesn't produce the result. There is destiny, there is time. So be patient. 
so when so actually this is very pragmatic if we are attached to results then if we don't get results we will become so disheartened that we will quit but if you understand that my work is in my hands let me do the best that i can destiny can sometimes be favorable sometimes it can be unfavorable when i talk about destiny in college with colleges and corporate com corporates companies i talk about have any of you experienced that you worked very hard for something but you didn't get it have any of you experienced that you worked very hard for something but you didn't get it everyone is experienced <laughs> isn't it yeah so now if i turn around uh, have you experienced that some you worked a little for something but a lot of other things fell in place and you got the result you got something that has also happened in our life if we look at our greatest successes we did work hard but our hard work alone did not determine the success so many other factors had to work out right so that's when the results come about i think the first time when uh, uh there was this indian cricketer who who made two double centuries in one day internationals he's retired no no he made only one i think yes sehwag sehwag so i was once traveling in india somewhere and i suddenly saw a headline of a newspaper it said so this is i knew god was on my side the sehwag so what was that i read the news article so what he said was that he was batting and he was batting quite well and then he, he miscued a shot when he miscued that shot that went it was a match against i think west indies mm -hmm. so there was one of their best fielders and the catch went to him and somehow he dropped the catch <laughs> so he said where he dropped the catch he said i knew god was on my side <laughs> <laughs> now uh, god doesn't take sides in a cricket match but the point is he is using the word god as a as a way of referring to something beyond our control so we see that there are times when destiny works for us and works against us but the point is that by seeing success not just in terms of results if i get the result i am successful but seeing success in terms of contribution have i done my best if i have done my best sooner or later results will come if we measure our success only in terms of the results then when the results don't come we will start beating ourselves up and we will become depressed so this bigger vision of ourselves our work and our success can help us face life situations life's adversities life's negativities with greater maturity any questions or comments till now destiny is on one side my mindset is towards that but uh, there is one more factor coming on another day and it's like everything is working so what i need to do is this situation okay <coughs> so when we feel inspired to do one thing but then the force of the situation seems to be pushing us in another direction yeah. what do we do at that time there are two Actually, this will be. I'll be talking it towards this at the end, but I can mention it now also. See, broadly speaking, life is like a tennis match. When we are playing tennis, sometimes the player is serving, sometimes the player is returning. Now, when the player is serving, they have much more control. Hmm? You serve on the forehand, backhand, into the ball. What are you playing? Everything they have control. But when they are returning, the so the returner may be very good at the. forehand but if the other player puts the ball in the backhand you cannot hit at the forehand you have to hit where the ball has come and get the ball back into play so all of us in our life sometimes are in situations where there are we have greater control of things and sometimes we have lesser control of things so for example in this class right now so when i am giving the class i have control over what i am going to speak but when i open the floor for question answers i don't have control over what question we're going to ask 
So whatever question you ask, I will just get the ball back into the court. You will reject it. So for all of us, it is important to understand when we are serving and when we are returning. That means if we are in a situation where our control is limited, then trying to increase that control. When you are returning, you cannot have the control like when we are serving. So except in this situation, my control is limited. And work with the best within that situation. In fact, I spoke the same point to, in a, I had a retreat for Americans in Chicago. And I spoke the same point, and after that, in that one, uh, the audience made the comment that actually the best players in tennis now, if you consider Federer, Nadal, or Djokovic, none of them are great, are really big boom servers. They were all-round good games. Some of them were good returners. So the point is that we don't necessarily bring out our best only when we have maximum control. So if we are in a situation where our control is limited, we accept that and we move on doing the best we can in that situation. And it's not that we will always be in that situation. One who is returning now, they'll also have opportunity to serve later. Mm -hmm. So sometimes life puts us in a situation where our control is limited. Resenting that only impedes our capacity to deal with that situation. So, so this is one part about accepting the reality that we are in and then reorienting ourselves accordingly. This does not necessarily mean that we give up our inspiration or our dream. It just means that we recognize our present reality. See, another example to illustrate this is if a ship wants to go in a particular direction, but if there's a strong storm coming, and there's just no way for the ship to go in that direction, the ship may choose to, okay, I'll go in this direction right now, wait for the storm to go away, then we'll move in this direction. So if the situation around us is just not changeable, then we go along with the situation at that particular time, do the best we can in that situation, and then wait for the situation to change. Now, there could be another situation entirely, is that where, <coughs> we, where, the, where the situation is pushing us in a particular direction, but we have the ability and the vision to create a different path for ourselves. But then we will have to go against the world. Now, Every choice brings with it a price. So sometimes the price may be too much. You know, going against everything in my life right now is not what I want to do right now. Or this is so important that I'm ready to go against everything. So the problem comes that we want to take a particular choice, but we don't want to pay the price for that choice. So sometimes we may, we may have to, I'll say, we have to make, we have to decide what is most important for us and act accordingly. So it would be best if uh, in such a situation we get thoughts out of our head. As long as thoughts are in our head, they congest us. So we can't think properly. So get them out, write things down with the pros, of, the pros and cons of everything and then maybe pray over it a little bit. Try to get yourself in a calm, reflective mood by a little meditation and then review the situation and then take the best decision. So life doesn't come with the guarantee of right decisions. Sometimes we make the right decisions, and sometimes we make the decisions right. We'll take a particular decision, and we make the best out of the decision. OK? Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. <coughs> so going to the situation, for example, <coughs> and thanks for asking that question, because you know that happens to almost all of us, right? <coughs> there are times when we don't really have control over the situation. <coughs> so how can, uh, first of all, like a devotee is better situated to deal with the situation? Or is he at the same level as someone who is not a devotee? So is the ability of a devotee to deal with such a situation better? And if yes, then in what aspect? Like how okay. his devotional service helps him to deal with this? Okay, if somebody is practicing bhakti, does it help them to deal with <coughs> difficult situations? Yes, definitely. Uh, if we consider the materialistic worldview, where God doesn't exist or God doesn't matter, then basically we have only two ways of looking at things. One is things are in my control or things are out of my control. And when things are in my control, I feel great. When things are out of my control, I 
feel greatly miserable. I feel powerless. I feel helpless. I feel choked up. But a spiritual vision helps us see that things that are out of our control are not necessarily out of control. There is a higher control. There is a higher plan. Now we look at the present and plan the future. God looks at the future and plans the present. So even if we look back at our lives, some of the worst things that happened in our life, if we look back at them now from distance, we may see that there's a lot of good that came out of it. So this, we often talk about the power of fighting. We have to fight for what we want. That's true at one level. But there is also a great amount of power required to let go. We can fight for something which is dear to us, but if something is over, then we have to let go of it. And letting go of it helps us to focus on what is in our control. Now, some of you may notice that I use crutches for walking. So when I was one, my parents gave me a uh, I went to a doctor and gave me an anti-polio vaccine, but somehow the doctor had messed it all up. So the vaccine was not protected, prop was not kept properly in the fridge, and the vaccine ended up giving me a polio instead of protecting me from polio. So now, when I am sometimes invited to people with to, to give talks to people with special needs, one thing I notice when I talk with such people after the after the talks at a one-to-one -one level, that many of them are fighting battles that they've lost long ago. It's like somebody lost an eye, somebody lost an arm, somebody lost a foot. It's like the battle is already lost. But why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? So that just wastes their energy. I mean, if I look back at my life, I don't remember that kind of resentment. <clears throat> and if I think about it, why was that? My parents told me from my childhood, that what you lack in physical ability, God has provided you in intellectual ability. So by that, I just didn't accept it and move on. So when there are certain things are not in our control, there is a great power to letting go. Now I have to use crutches constantly for walking, but for others they may notice it the first thing. But for me the crutches are like my glasses. I need them for functioning, but what is the big deal about it? I just use it and move on. So generally, this power of letting go. When something is not in our control, we let go of it. That power of letting go is increased by devotion. Because devotion helps us to understand that things that are out of our control, there is a higher plan. Okay? Thank you. Any other question? <laughs> yeah. By adharma, do you mean something which is not again not according to your nature, or you're, are you saying something which is really your, is immoral like or unethical, or what do you mean by adharma? Uh, it's like completely against the moral. Against morality. Yeah. Okay. So if there is something which you feel inspired to do, on the other hand, there's something which is we are being pushed to do, uh, which is uh, immoral. Then what do we do? There is, there's a, as I said, there's a price to be paid for every choice. And if a particular choice is making us focus on, you know, do something which is which we don't want to do, and it's also wrong, then maybe it's required to take a stand at that time. So it requires courage uh, to stand out and to nourish our soul when everybody around us is busy selling their souls. But, so uh, sometimes when we choose a different path, at that time we may forsake certain external markers of success. 
but we may get a lot of internal fulfillment for having lived according to our courage, according to our convictions, to have been true to ourselves. So sometimes, you know, we may seek respect in the world's eyes. That's is important if we want to be a leader. But more important than respect in the world's eyes is respect in our own eyes. So if we do something which goes against our, our values, then we fall down in our own eyes. So what do we do in such a situation? You know, we have to, again, just because uh, we see the situation this and this, that may not be the entirety of the situation. There could be nuances. If it's a major decision with huge consequences, it, as I said, it may be good to write things down first so that there's a distance between us and our thoughts. As long as thoughts are inside us, they're so close to us, we can't think objective. But when they're outside us, we can think better. And then we may might be able to find a way uh, ahead which does not involve us compromising our morals. But at the same time, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to go against the world entirely. So you could, it could be possible that you can find a way which is uh, not that bad. And it may also be important to consult someone else whom we trust. Not necessarily to take their opinion as final, but just to get a perspective from their side. And we have to, we have, it's important in the long run to have a sense of fulfillment more than a sense of achievement. Achievements are externals. And the medals and the trophies, uh, sometimes the certificates that we get, they are no, after down several years down the line, they may not even be worth the paper on which they were printed. But fulfillment, if we are lived true to ourselves, that will be of far greater value to us. So think about it and then you can make a decision. Okay? Can you talk afterwards one to one if you want to? Yeah, I have a few more questions. Yeah, sure, we can talk one to one. So let's move on. So now I talk about this expanding, and I talk about two last parts in our talk here, appreciating, and that is the uh, third part. Now appreciating means that for a leader, it's important not just to do the best oneself, but also to bring out the best in others. And for that, appreciating others is extremely important. Chanakya Pandit says that the most important skill of a king is not the skill with the sword, with swords, but its skill with words. A king is one who inspires others to act, not just who acts. Of course, personal excellence is required, but along with that, the much more important is the capacity to inspire others. And one of the most powerful ways to inspire others is by our words. The words shape words. Now, words are like arrows. Once they leave a tongue, then we can't withdraw them. So, watch your words. And appreciating means that actually speaking to, uh, to everybody in life means encouragement. Now, just as if you're driving a car, the fuel is needed for the car to move on. So just as fuel is what enables the car to move, similarly, the heart needs the fuel of encouragement. So if we just make it a habit, every day I will appreciate someone, at least one person. Now it doesn't, the appreciation is different from flattery. Flattery is done so that uh, it may or may not be true. We do it so that just we can buttress the other person uh, so that they will do what we want them to do. But appreciation is where we observe others, see something good in them, and we express our heart. Uh, the, this can actually uh, inspire people in great ways. And uh, one of my friends is a, is a mental health counselor, and he works, he sometimes works uh, on suicide helplines. So he tells me that actually it's such a high pressure job. People call when they're on the verge of committing suicide. And the right word at that time is stop them from committing suicide. When the right word is not spoken, they become suicide. So 
that is a situation where actually uh, words can literally be like seeds. But that's a very dramatic situation. But in our life, around us, we don't know who is going through what. And encouraging others can be a very simple and yet powerful way in which we can do good to others. We can lead others not by getting them to do what we want them to do, but by helping them be the best that they can be. Sometimes when someone passes away, you know, we often hold memorials for them. And during the memorials, people come together and speak. Oh, this person was so good. This person did this for me. This person was like this at this time. They all share memories of how good that person was. Uh, I was at one such memorial. And it was a very moving memorial for a for an acquaintance who had passed away. And after that, my spiritual teacher, he spoke. He spoke something very profound. He said, oh, it is wonderful that all of you have appreciated the soul so sweetly. He said, how many of you appreciated him like this when he was alive? Now, why do we leave appreciating others to their memory will service. If that person had been alive and they'd appreciated them, they would have been so much more encouraged. So some actually, we all, if we look at our lives, there are people who help us in different ways, people who inspire us in different ways. Somehow our mind tends to go towards the negatives. And if somebody doesn't do something for us, we catch them doing wrong and beat them up for it. And, and get angry with them for that. But a leader's quality is that a leader catches others doing right. When somebody's doing something right, they appreciate it. Uh, uh, I think Mark Twain said that, uh, he was an author and he said, I can go for two months on one good appreciation. So appreciation has great power. And that power can be unleashed if we can uh, learn to speak properly. The Bhagavad Gita talks about austerity of speech. Austerity means tapasya. What it means is that we may have an urge to lash out at others. But the Bhagavad Gita says, speak in a way anudvega karam vakyam satyam priyaktam chet. Speak in a way that does not agitate others. Speak in a way that does not, that is truthful, but at the same time it is helpful. It is pleasing, it is uplifting. So this is the power of leaders. That is, even if we don't have great extraordinary abilities, but within our situation, we can appreciate others. So I believe I wait till death to appreciate someone. And the last part is, I spoke on this briefly a little bit, that deciding. In every situation, we have to decide what to do. And broadly, when we have to decide something, the, the situations we face can, the problems that we face can fall in three broad categories. There's something which is directly in our control. Something which is, or we have only indirect control. And something on which we have no control. Say for example, our, we are doing some project and our, uh, we are, the project guide is unhappy with us. Now that could be, if we have not met our targets. Then in that case, it's in direct control. Let me work with greater complete. Sometimes, some things are, we can have only indirect control. Some people are just irritable for, that's just their way of working. They just, they must nag, they find faults. Then at that time, all that we can do is that we don't let them get to us. We don't let them make us irritable. It said that the best thing we can, the best thing we can do for the poor is to not be one of them. That doesn't mean we want to be superior to them, but if we become poor, we can't help others. So, so sometimes the, we have very little control over situation. The, then we can only, in, if we remain, we remain, we remain kind, we remain gentle, we remain polite. And gradually that may have an effect on them and they may also start becoming polite. That's indirect control. And some problems are of no control. Say like the weather is cold. 
It's freezing. If you have a terribly cold, what can we do? It's just the weather. We accept it and move on with life. So deciding means that we have the capacity to discern every situation. What is in my control? What is not in my control? So for Arjun, when he had to fight a war, it was an extremely painful situation for him. Because on his opposite side was his teacher and his grandfather. He would love to respect them, honor them. He had no desire to fight against them. But somehow, by destiny, he had been put in a situation where he had to fight against them. They had tried their best to avoid war. Uh, our, we have Duryodhan who had, in public, uh, tried to dishonor Draupadi. Now, to break the law is bad. Hmm? To break the law in public is worse. To break the law in public in front of those who are meant to protect the law. That is the worst. Like somebody robs someone, that's bad. Somebody robs someone in public, it's bad. Somebody goes into a police station and robs someone. <laughs> that is the worst. <laughs> so, what Duryodhana had done was like that. Now, in front of the king, in front of the ministers, in front of those who are meant to enforce law, he was openly trying to dishonor an honorable lady. And he was so brazen that he was not even slightly remorseful. Even after the Pandavas lived in forest for 13 years, when they came back, at that time he was not remorseful. He was not even reconciliatory. Krishna himself went as a peace messenger. And Krishna is the greatest warrior of that times. Even if people, somebody doesn't accept him <coughs> as God, still he's the greatest warrior of his time. It's like we say, India-Pakistan, there's a conflict going on. And to, to go for peace, suppose the Indian Prime Minister goes there. And then, what does Duryodhan do? He, Krishna says, just give them five villages. And uh, Duryodhan says, what to see your five villages? I will not give you enough land to even put the tip of a needle through. Now, there, there, what is this? There is, there is sometimes we say no to a person. Sometimes, sometimes we say no to a request. Somebody invites us, please come for this program. Sorry, you know, I've got this to do, this to do, I can't come for this. That's no to a request, no to invitation. But if, if we invite someone for a program and they say, even if I die, my dead body will not come to your program. <laughs> 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 now, then that's not no to, a, no to the request, that's no to the person. So when Duryodhan said like that, I will not give enough land to even put the tip of needle to it. So it's banging the door in the face. He said no to a person. And as if that was not bad enough, he tried to arrest Krishna. Like Indian Prime Minister goes to for a peace proposal and pa pa Pakistan tries to arrest Indian Prime Minister. It would be outrageous. So basically, at that time, Arjun was in a situation of no control. They had done everything possible to avoid the war. Sometimes we say that I have done everything humanly possible. The Pandavas had done everything humanly possible and everything divinely possible. But still, there's no control. So at that time, Krishna told Arjuna, focus on what is in your control. And your control is to fight. So you fight not to take revenge against others. You fight to establish the rule. Fight to rule, establish the rule of virtue. If a person like Duryodhana is so brazenly criminal in public, that person is given unfettered control over the world, over the kingdom. He will wreak havoc. So therefore now, uh, beyond the specifics of what happened to Arjuna, if we look at uh, the specifics of Arjuna's situation, uh, that he had to principle is that Arjun, at the start of the Gita, was confused, was disheartened. He had put aside his bow, saying, I can't fight. Now what the Gita did was, it raised his eyes. It helped him see the bigger picture. It helped him see the bigger purpose of his life. That he was a part of something bigger than himself. And the result of that was, he picked up his bow. So Arjun's bow represents our determination, our enthusiasm, our confidence. Sometimes life puts us in such perplexities that we just put aside our bow and say, I can't do it. I couldn't do it. But hearing the Bhagavad Gita's message, 
just as it inspired arjun it can inspire us it can invigorate us with a sense of purpose with a sense of confidence with determination and this is the ultimate power that a leader has that the leader stays determined even amidst adversities and inspires others to be determined obstacles will come in life but if we have a purpose that is bigger than the obstacles then we will still persevere through them so life determines our problems we determine their size and when we have a bigger picture of life then the problem doesn't consume our vision if this problem is there but let me move on in it that is the empowering vision for personal leadership that the bhagavad gita offers us i'll summarize what i spoke i spoke on the theme of who is a leader started by talking of how there is public leadership and personal leadership and without the foundation of being one's own leader being collective without that even if one has the qualities by which one can be charismatic and can control people but that will simply increase the height from which we fall and we get others to fall so public leadership is the foundation for the building of sorry personal leadership is the foundation for the superstructure of public leadership and the gita is a book about personal leadership it is between two leaders krishna and arjun leadership is not so much a matter of designation as of disposition and <clears throat> to develop that disposition of leadership i talked about an acronym lead does anyone remember what was lead l was learning yes so learn to learn from life the universe is like a university so a leader is one who is a constant learner we learn by observing external situations we learn by going inwards we become receptive to inspiration from a higher source we link with the inner leader the gita gives us the spiritual principles of devotion by which we can link with our inner leader and thus we can be on a mood of learning and sharing then e was expanding so those who are nitty gritties of small things the leader sees a big picture and to see the big picture we talk about the gita expands our vision of the self that we are not the roles and the goals that we set for ourselves we are bigger than that our worth is more than our net worth or our grade points no if we are not like a river that has to be stuck to one channel we can find another channel and move on in life and talk about work work in a mood of worship that instead of obsessing over specific things to do and get them done we see work as a mood of contribution doing our best in a mood of service and worship work itself is not worship but work can be done in a mood of worship and third was success that if we are attached to results then we are basing our sense of success on something that is not in our control and that sets us up for frustration and depression the gita tells us be detached from results but do set goals and that way we can always be on the path where we are making our best contribution and i talked about how the phala the result comes from not just our karma our work but also the evil destiny and kala time so sometimes when these these are favorable sometimes destiny is favorable sometimes it is unfavorable so recognizing that life is like a tennis game we we act according to whether we have more control or less control appropriately then what was the next one a was appreciating the most important virtue of a leader in terms of relationships is to inspire others to do their best and i talked about how appreciation is fuel for the heart just as of uh, we have petrol or diesel for fuel for the vehicle and why should we reserve the appreciation of our appreciation of others to their memory and service appreciate them right now make a habit of appreciating people once one person at least per day and flattery is where we want <coughs> others we want we just speak even untruth to get people to do what we want them to do appreciation is that we observe others see the good in them and speak it out and last d was determining so determining means we have to decide how do we decide 
we look at what is in our con direct control, what is in our indirect control, and what is not in our control, and appropriately shape our actions. A spiritual vision helps us to see that things that are beyond our, not in our control, are still not out of control. There is a higher plan. And thus we can tap the power of letting go. And just as Arjun was disheartened at the start of the Gita, but he picked up his bow with confidence at the end of the Gita. Similarly, understanding the Gita's message can infuse us with similar determination. Even if there are adversities to dishearten us, we can, with a sense of divine purpose, march forward in our life and be a leader internally and externally. Thank you very much. Thank you. So any questions or comments? source that is within us which guides us mm. like a GPS so how do we differentiate whether it's the higher source guiding us or just some whimsical thought okay good question so how do we know whether whatever is guiding us is the higher source or some arbitrary whimsical thought generally there is no way to look within and put a label on what is what are the voices coming from within instead of focus on where something is taking us so if something is taking us in a positive direction, then that is that is something which you can consider. And if something takes us in a negative direction, then we better check ourselves. And sometimes if you're not able to decide what is positive, what which direction a particular thing is taking us in, then we acknowledge that inner voice, that inner suggestion, and then keep it in abeyance for some time. Because within us is a creative side and there's also a critical side. No, as a, I'm a, one of my main services is writing. So as a writer, it's a creative side that generates ideas. Yeah, you can write on this, you can write on this, you can write on this. And it is a critical side which evaluates these ideas. So that which idea is really worth investing the time on. So if the creative side is too strong and the critical side is not strong, then you may write a lot. The critical side is too strong then the search for quality becomes so high that there's no quantity in it. Practically don't write at all. So there has to be a balance between the creative and the critical side. So one of the best ways to do is to separate the two. And then the creative side is coming up, just let it come. Just write down every idea that comes up. But don't work on developing every idea. The critical side comes, after, after we have gone through that creative phase, we got the idea, okay, note it down, maybe wait for 24 hours, be in a calmer frame of mind, then go to the let the critical side go on and repeat it. Yeah, this makes sense. This I have to get more information. This the sound is great, but it's not going to work. This I may I may put it for later. So like that you can evaluate. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> so thank you very much for your attention and participation. Hare Krishna.